Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome back to my YouTube channel. Salmanikbal here. You can find me on Twitter at Salmanikbal. I'm a trainer at Learn K8. On this channel, we discuss everything cloud native. In this video, we're going to be talking about Kubernetes API, the API server. You know that thing that lets you query and manipulate things such as pods, events, and resources? Yep, that's the one. Today, we're going to be looking at the details of what actually happens when you submit a request to Kubernetes API. Let's say we have a user and with coffee within reach. We write a deployment file. The deployment file is a recipe for an application that we're trying to deploy to our cluster. It defines what container image we want to deploy and how many replicas we would like to run. So what we do is we send the request to Kubernetes API by running a command kubectl apply minus f deployment.yaml. This is to inform the Kubernetes control plane of our intention to deploy two replicas of the red app that we defined in our deployment file previously. The control plane is in charge of managing worker nodes and pods in the cluster. Inside the control plane, the API receives the request and the JSON payload. You might be thinking, but I just sent a YAML file though. Well, when you use kubectl, it converts your YAML resource into JSON and sends it forward. The API server takes the request that we just sent and saves it into a key value database. Just like other things in Kubernetes, the pronunciation of its name is at times debated. You might have heard it being referred to as etcd or etc. D. The important thing to remember is that it is a high availability key value database. The database stores the document that we just sent. It will store all the information regarding the deployment, like what image we want it to use, how many replicas it needs, etc. So far, I have shown you the API server as a single block in the diagram. However, in reality, there are several components involved in processing the request. The first component in the API server is the HTTP handler. We can think about the HTTP handler as a web server ready to receive HTTP requests that we or the other systems send to it. Let's move on to the next component. Kubernetes, as you're aware, has two types of users. Normal users like you and I, or service accounts managed by Kubernetes. Authentication checks if the user or service account should be allowed to access the cluster. Next comes the authorization. This checks whether you as a user can create, delete, update, or list the given resource within the cluster. This is where role-based access control rules are evaluated. If you as a user are not authenticated or do not have the correct roles assigned, your request will be rejected here. Let's assume you are authenticated and authorized to create pods so what happens next? The API then passes the request to the mutations admission controller. This component is in charge of looking at your YAML and modifying it or mutating it, hence the name mutation controller. Let's say you forget to add a default storage class to your YAML. The admissions controller will add that in for you. After all those modifications, does the pod still look like a pod? Well, that is the purpose of the schema validation component. It makes sure that the resource you sent and after it got modified is still valid against the internal schema. Well, we don't want to malinform the YAML to be stored in the cluster, so we have to run through a schema validation. We're not done yet. Let's carry on with our journey. Have you ever tried to deploy a pod in a namespace that doesn't exist? And it usually comes back with a response saying, ah, you're trying to deploy a pod in a namespace that does not exist. It is indeed the validation admissions controller that stops you from being naughty, or perhaps you're trying to deploy more resources than you have the quota for. Validation and admissions controller stops you again. It is in fact acting like a gatekeeper. If you do manage to pass the validation admissions controller, your resource is safely stored in etcd. Well done. I know what you're wondering. Now that we know about mutations admissions controller and validation admissions controller, wouldn't it be great if we could design our own and implement our own rules? Well, want to know more. Great news. It can definitely be done. You can write your own scripts with your rules and register your scripts with the mutation admissions controller. You can also do the same with the validation admission controller. For example, you could design your checks and decide if a resource should be rejected from reaching etcd. Kubernetes customization. We love it. There are two excellent examples of custom admissions controllers that you are probably aware of. Istio automatically injects an extra Envoy proxy container to all pods. This is an example of a mutations admission controller. On the other hand, Open Policy Agent is an excellent example of customization of a validations admission controller. It checks your resources against policies and reports any violations. So, there we have it. 
I hope that gives you a bit of an insight into what actually happens when you submit a request to Kubernetes API. A lot actually happens before your request actually gets persisted into the database. Our request goes through a journey, and the journey starts with a HTTP handler, and then it goes via authentication, authorization, mutations controller, schema validation, and validation admissions controller. If all those checks pass, only then our YAML that we submit is actually persisted into the database. If you would like more details on this topic, I've included links to some excellent blogs in the description below if you'd like to check them out. If you'd like to see more content like this, please consider subscribing to this channel and sharing with your friends and colleagues. Until next time, thank you for listening and stay safe.